This functional thing is important because there's a, a paradigm shift happening in parts of programming. It's always good to keep up with what's going on there. And in order to understand what functional programming is and how it works with Java, we're going to start off today with a brief review of interfaces. And so I'm going to ask you to take out your computers and work with me here. Uh, let me start off by mentioning that this functional interface section is taken from a, a mini course on YouTube that is available for free by this guy named JetBrains. Now, I suspect that JetBrains works for uh, IntelliJ or one of these uh, companies. Yeah. So he has this course here, which is called Lambda Basics. Now, Lambda is the technique that Java uses to implement Java's version of functional programming. I'll explain the difference as we go. But if I click on this, if I click on this, you'll see that there is a 25 video set. Now, don't let this scare you. The vast majority of the videos are less than 10 minutes, and many are less than five minutes. So if you really wanted to crash through this material, and I'm not suggesting it, but if you really wanted to crash through it, you could probably get it done in a weekend. If I'm going too slow for you, I'm going to teach you most of this course, but if I'm going too slow for you or you need to review it sometime down the road when you're in college, uh, this is uh, a great way to do it. And I'm going to take a lot from his lectures and my lectures. Now, let me start off by saying to you that Java is not a functional language. Java is an object-oriented language. It was built from the ground up to have inheritance properties. And functional is a very different paradigm. Now, I will say that the Java people at Oracle have done a fantastic job of retrofitting functional features into Java. When Java went from Java 7 to Java 8 a few years back, it was probably like uh, seven, eight years ago this happened. They did a fantastic job of incorporating functional features into the language in such a way as to not disturb anything that Java had already done, but give you a lot of the features of function, uh, functional languages. Having said that, if you were going to build a large functional application from scratch today, Java would be one of the last languages you would pick to for that job because it's just not a functional language to begin with. It's, it's an object-oriented language that has some functional features. So what languages would you pick for functional? There are languages like Haskell and other languages like that that are built to be functional. They're just going to be a lot more terse and more effective at being at representing functional code. But because this is a Java course and you already know Java, it's just going to be much easier for me to teach you functional programming using Java and its extensions versus having to teach you a whole new language to do it. So we're just going to go through and talk about how Java does functional but the main goal here is to give you a flavor for what functional programming looks like. Once again, as I mentioned to you, in order to do that, I need to review interfaces with you. So here you can see if I create, let me create a brand new project for here. Uh, we'll call this uh, functional project. And uh, I'm going to create this class called A. Here's my class called A. I have this class. Now, in Java, if I want to inherit, let's say I want to create another class called uh, uh, Z, and I want to have Z inherit from A, uh, you know that it's a simple thing to do. The only thing I have to do is I just have to say uh, extends A like that. And with those two simple words, you can see I can create an inheritance relationship. Now, at the beginning of the year, we said that in addition to having an inheritance relationship, we could have another type of relationship, which is an interface relationship. So here, let's say I create this new interface, uh, and I call it uh, I, right? I for interface. You can see here now in BlueJ, they, they, they give it a little interface moniker. But the main difference here is you can you see I use the keyword here, interface, instead of class. That's what defines it to be an interface. Now, an interface typically will not have any code in it. What we'll have instead will be one or more of these stubbed out methods that end in semicolon instead of having uh, curly brackets. And you can have as many of these as you want. So for example, let's say I created this interface that had um, 
these three methods in it. Now, here, here's the general idea. Any class that implements this interface, this I interface, has to provide these methods. That, that's the idea. So you can think of the interface as like a club. And if you join the club, you get certain benefits, but you have to pay some dues to join the club. And here are the dues that you have to pay. You have to write these methods in order to join this club. So now it's a simple matter. If I wanted to have A, for example, or you know what, let me do it with Z instead. Uh, if I want to have Z, which already is extending A, I also wanted to have it um, implement the interface. I just go like this. OK, you're right. OK, so this is the syntax for it. And you can see in this case, I am extending A and I'm also implementing I. The reason why the compiler is complaining is that I have to implement those three methods and I haven't done so yet. Now, one important rule in Java, Java comes from C++, C++ comes from C. And in C++, C++ is a multiple inheritance language. That means in C++, you can go like this. And you can uh, inherit from two or, or you can inherit from two classes, three classes, whatever. But in Java, you can only inherit from one class. That keeps a lot of the structures for the code much simpler. Now, to get around the fact that sometimes you need to have features from multiple classes, uh, one thing that you can do in Java is that you can have inherit from one class, but you can implement as many interfaces as you want. So here, for example, if I had multiple interfaces like I, J, and K, you would you would uh, write it like that. Here you can see I'm extending A, I'm inheriting from A, but I'm implementing all three of these interfaces. So that's how you would do it. And this is a great compromise because it keeps the code structures relatively simple, but you can essentially pick up features from multiple different uh, previous definitions of classes or interfaces like that. Now, hopefully everything that I've said to you up until now has been a review of what you have learned much earlier in the year. We're going to talk a little bit now about this interface. And it turns out that there are three different types of interfaces in Java. And the interfaces depend, and the interfaces are going to depend on how many abstract methods there are. So if you have if you have zero abstract methods, that's one type of interface. Does anybody know what we call that interface when you have no abstract methods in an interface? That's called a marker interface. And an example of that would be the serializable. Now, I don't remember if we covered serializable. Did we do serializable this year? It might have been one of the topics I took out. But you can think of a marker interface like this. I mentioned to you that joining an interface or implementing an interface is like joining a club. So there are dues to pay, but there are no dues to pay if it's a marker interface. The only thing you have to do to join a, a marker interface is say, hey, I want to be in your club. And that's it. You're in. So a class can, for example, say that they're implementing the serializable interface and immediately they become serializable. I should capitalize this, by the way. And what does serializable do? What serializable does is it allows a class to have objects that are stored in a file, put to sleep, and then later on in some other program can wake up the object and pick up where execution left off. So that's like a handy thing to have. Uh, so serializable lets you store objects in a file and restart them. And so you can uh, do that simply by implementing the serializable interface. Now, you might be asking, well, how come everything's not serializable? Well, when you implement the serializable interface, you don't have to do any work as a programmer, but the compiler has to do a bunch of extra work, and it makes things uh, a little bit less efficient. So that's why you only want to use it when you really need it. So serializable is an example of a marker interface, no abstract methods. Now, the next kind is you have uh, an interface with exactly one abstract method. Okay, now in uh, Java versions one through seven, this was given a special name. 
Does anybody know what it was called in the first seven versions of Java? I'll give you a hint. It referred to single abstract method. It was called the SAM interface. The SAM refers to single abstract method. And that was a really clever name. And that name would have stuck except for the fact that when Java version 8 came out, the, the developers of Java at Oracle decided to include functional capabilities. And the entire rest of the world referred to this interface that did functional work as functional interfaces. They renamed this interface and no longer call it single abstract method interface or SAM interface. They now refer to it as a functional interface. And then the other types of interfaces where you have two or more abstract methods, these are just called normal interfaces. Okay, so you have three types of interfaces, marker interfaces where you have no abstract methods, single abstract method, which is the old terminology for the, for the interface now called the Java's functional interface has exactly one abstract method. And then the other ones where uh, you have two or more.